because you're jumping back into the gut. Oh, let's hey, go. Coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballimmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media, on Twitter at Bball Immersion, or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Awesome today, coaches, to welcome Vin Bavani with us to the podcast. Uh, Vin is a longtime NBA coach, most recently with the Oklahoma City Thunder as an assistant coach. He's been heavily involved in all aspects of basketball, but uh, today we're going to focus on a little bit of player development, scouting, and uh, we're going to start with something which is a little bit different as well, and that is, Vin, for the first time in 18 years, you are looking for a job. First of all, welcome to the podcast. Secondly, what's that experience been like? Chris, no, thank you. No, it's it's a uh, it's been uh, eye opening. It's been it's been good. Um, you know, I, I hear the feedback from fellow coaches on how it's a uh, it's a really a good thing uh, because you know when you go in for a long time and I, I was here, you don't, you end up being comfortable. Um, you know, with kind of uh, that role that you've you've been providing. You know, so uh, any ambition and that sort of thing that you had leading up to you know this career path. Um, kind of went out the window for me, uh, in, in a way, uh, with, with that comfort. Uh, but it's been a learning experience. You know, I think the, the one thing I've really learned is just from a tactical standpoint in terms of finding a new job is, is can, you know, wherever you're looking for, like, who is that person that's hiring and, and can you get them in some way to think about interviewing you? Right. That's, that's, a, that's really like what you're trying to do. Uh, there's certain kind of games around that, you know, depending on your experience and people always say, you know, your contacts and your, you know, uh, your references and, you know, who, you know, it's a, who, you know, business, you know, pretty much with the, with a lot of things in entertainment, it's, it's almost like that. And if you're the right fit, um, but, you know, I'm learning that, you know, with all, with this, it's just, you know, the people that I've actually you know, had relationships with and kind of got in contact with over the years, you know, it's a, uh, it's pretty eye opening. It's like, well, there's a lot of people, you know, and I think that's just natural. It's not because I'm like the most outgoing guy. It's just the amount of people that you, you interact with and depend on through these years. And it's, it's, you almost take it for granted in a way. Uh, so it's, it's been good, um, you know, and along, along the ride, I think some people kind of learn how to play a certain game with it. I don't think that's, in my own deal, I think it just comes natural, you know, like if you give energy to others, it'll end up coming back to you uh, is what I'm finding out. But just certain certain things I think that could help coaches because uh, I'm, I'm asking some some old heads, you know, and, and I'm getting some good feedback from them uh, as far as like, you know, forming a mission statement for yourself because we're in a service business, you know, whether you're serving the owner of a professional team or maybe in college you're serving you know, the president of the university, uh, whoever it is, you know, who are you serving? And then what can, what are you providing that they're paying for? You know what I mean? Like, can you actually answer that question? Like, what are you providing that costs a salary? You know, so I think that's important to kind of self-reflect and find that, you know, and then, and then like, what sort of services are you providing is an important question. Uh, and also developing, I know growing up, cause I have a daughter, she's 10 and she hasn't really experienced an inner circle of friends. You know, like I grew up in the same neighborhood and, and that, that was, I'm always going to remember those times and sharing those experiences with people and figuring out life and doing stupid things. And, and you could be yourself around your kind of your inner circle. Uh, I think that's important in, in professional, uh, deals also, cause your former relationships, like who can you actually answer who your inner circle is, you know, or that you can piggyback ideas and be wrong. And if you were to ask for help, it would actually help you, you know? So I think if you can kind of, these are all things I never really thought about that. That's so important, you know, uh, with this. So, I mean, those are some of the things I think I've learned And then, You know, a confidence deal is like a fine line between, you know, ego and confidence. Uh, confidence is important, you know, like, cause I've, I've, uh, you know, people are pumping me up or like, I've actually talked to some guys and they're like, man, if one day I could go to the front of the bench, you know, you know, it, you know, the people I'm talking to, like somebody 
told me that he's in the league for 11 years. I'm like, are you serious? You've been in the league for 11 years. You've been a head coach. Like you should be on the front of the bench. Like that's okay to think that way, you know? Uh, but then there's a fine line to that. Like there's some people that get into the business and they're like, I'm going to be their greatest. You know, I'm going to do this. And, and, and you know what? It fuels them. Like there's driving forces, you know, that can be like fueling your ego. Like your ego is telling you, I want to be the greatest of all time. Or I want to do this. And I, I think there's, for me, that's a little tricky, you know, because now you're serving, instead of serving somebody or especially when you get in, you're kind of serving yourself. And, and, I, and I feel like in the business as an assistant uh, is what I'm experienced with. I've noticed, you know, part of there's like six mini head coaches. You know, I, I don't know if that's the right thing. I, I mean, I'm not one to say that that's the right thing, but it it's it kind of is fuel to that. Like, is your driving force like to be a head coach that much? Like in the moment, you're you're assisting the head coach. So, like, what are things that you're providing that's you know not like basically trying to do that job? You know what I mean? So, and I, I just noticed that like in halftime meetings or whatever it may be. It's just like you're having these conversations about what the head coach is, uh, you know, what he's thinking about. But what are you doing to provide things that he's not thinking about? You know, just little things like that. I think a lot of that is ego driven. And it's like once you can kind of eliminate that, that like I'm in this role, you know, how the role is to serve this to the best of my ability. Like that's the role. It's not necessarily one day I'm going to be the greatest head coach. And then you're in a role right now. And if, you're, if your thoughts are back onto that driving force i think you're you're serving yourself instead of that person you're supposed to be serving if that makes any sense well so. some great great lessons in there i mean number one just just that starting from that question of what value am i bringing that someone would pay for like i again like i can't think there's a better way of framing it to, than just that and and knowing so many people that know you obviously by the time this podcast is released you might be in a job but definitely you bring value. And we're going to get into some of those topics that you bring value about today. But uh, you also talked about some of these ways to be able to put yourself out there to these different organizations. What are the most effective ways to do that nowadays? That's really, really good. So with experience, you almost ha know who the hiring person is. You know, So if it's G League, if it's NBA, NBA is more out there. It's more public. But there's certain uh, professional avenues. And, and, you know, I'm even looking, I was looking, you're in Canada, you know, there's NBL league over there. But like, just learn a lot about that. Learn who does the hiring for what team, you know, and, and now to do that, that you can lean on relationships, you can lean on your agent, if you have one, that's the importance of an agent, because the agent will kind of help you through that. But there are so many other avenues that I'm like learning you know, oh, that's what that person's job was. So like learn each each person in the organization, what what their job, what what do they do well? You know, that, that kind of stuff. But not just play the game like, oh, OK, I'm in it for a mission to kind of like so that person can help me down the road. But you're doing it to like for the relationship. Like, are you giving energy to that person? Are you making them better? You know, is it true? Is it a real relationship? But there's such a small fraternity that like even nowadays i'm I'm noticing you know I, I keep thinking of myself as young but i'm not so like the person that's making a decision in one organization i'm looking at is a 30 year old that you know an intern that used to work for me like he was best friends with <laughs> you know what i'm saying so like who no matter who who it is that person has a factor in a decision that can possibly influence your life in the future no matter who it is in this business you know, and kind of take that approach to basically give your energy and invest in everybody, you know, and it's just the right thing to do anyways, if you're a good person, but it comes back to you, you know? Well, it's, and again, it's, it's not overstated that your network and, and your relationships are so important. And, and uh, clearly that's still the case, but, you know, there's also some part to this, which is, getting it out there, kind of what your role and responsibilities were, right? Like, like, how do organizations find out that, you know, Vin is, from all accounts that I've heard of, tremendous with skill development, tremendous with offensive footwork. So you are a development coach. Well, you're also really well known for scouting and advanced, I guess, scouting. So how do you get that out there to organizations that may not know you as well? 
Well, the the players and this I'm only speaking on the, this business of the NBA because uh, that's course. all I really know. But yep. the uh, the players are going to end up being decision makers in the future. You know that that's one. Uh, the coaches you work with, they're going to end up you know moving on. Uh, so it just the tentacles kind of go out there. If they're if those are real relationships, then that true nature will come out. Now, if they're like relationships or you're sort of i'm just calling it a political game you know you're playing that then those people are not going to like embrace that even if you have the skills to do good good and different things and in, in different areas well that person may say like hey you know he, that guy's fake so i'm not gonna like showcase that with with people around my organization but people the organizations all talk there's so much money in the game that like you're being exposed constantly you know through you know, that person's network of the coach or player or front office that you're not even really like thinking about. They're talking to other organizations. You know what I'm saying? So this sort of this sort of cycle happens through through the recruitment period, you know. So now, like, for example, this is a G League recruitment period for the next couple of weeks. There's a few openings, but these openings might these different teams might be opening next year. You know what I mean? And they're going to go through this phase. So it's it that like do the people in your organization know what you do what you do well you know and that's going to be broadcasted you know to other organizations eventually you know what i'm saying so uh and and, and there's part of that that you know what you, you got to take some of that on your own too you know like do you have an agent again a- agents are huge and then you know are people in organization like i'm not going to say sell yourself but like or do they know what your what your mission statement is? That's why it's so good to have one of those, you know. And then that that should be you know kind of broadcasted out there in a little way. I mean, there's different ways. The more you have relationships with people outside of your organization, you know, that's going to slowly start to come out because they're inquiring too. And the whole goal is, just, since there's so much money in the game, it's like try to get the best people you possibly can, you know. So they want to know what you do. Like the people want to know what you do. It's just a matter of you recognizing that, you know, in, in the online marketing world, they call it a 12 second pitch, a 10 second pitch. Like it's mm-hmm. something that really quickly gets to the point of who you are and what you do, because as we know, like you have a certain amount of time to capture people. So like, and we've all got these before these really long pitch emails or stuff like that. It's like, right. I like what you're saying. Cause to a certain extent, you're talking about being very concise initially so that again, exactly what value you bring that's right comes to the forefront it's quick you know i mean it could it could be anything i mean i've heard things like all right the gym will be taken care of 365 days like that but that's priceless like just think about that statement like that your players are good you know i mean there's there's just just what is it you know that's just like the player the coach knows or whoever you're serving knows like wow okay they're gonna make the team better in that way or me better in that way you know so yeah, I love that. I love that. That's a great statement. So, yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot. It's, it's it's things I never thought about. You know what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm lucky. I'm fortunate to have. I'm leaning on the experience a little bit. You know, and I can only imagine if you're, you know, one or two years in, you don't know, you don't, your network's not as much. I can see how that, that can be tough. You know, and I'm not saying hey, I'm going to land a job or whatever like that, but it, you have to like the experience definitely helps. You know, it definitely helps with that. So, um, and I think that's probably the reason why, in, you know, in previous years, and, and like I'm reading Obama's book right now, really good book, but like, gotta, I took a risk when I first entered this business. I'm like, are you still taking those risks to get, you know, like what you want? Like, I'm starting, I'm getting energy right now, like, in terms of, man, I wanna do this, man, this is great. Like, it's okay to go and take some more risks, you know? And I think, I think, unless you love where you're at, and, you know, but at the same time, I just kind of, coasted for for a couple years you know and i think when it gets to that point i'm learning now like that's you know uh, it, it i don't know like it got stale and you know and i think i think i'm learning to like be okay with some of the risks and sometimes you get you go you get better on the other end when you do take some risks you know so yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for your transparency and, uh, you know, your honesty in this way, because I, I love the, the point that you just brought up, which is, OK, so we we are willing to go through these really crazy sacrifices to get in the door. But That's what right. we don't sometimes realize is when we're in the door and we're pushed out again, we have to go through the same process again. And right. 
you know, the old coach, ma, I slept in my car. I did whatever I could to get to summer league, to meet people and then got a job. And now I'm out of the industry. You got to almost do the same thing and be prepared to do the same thing again. Right. That's, that's right. That's right. And, and if you recognize it during the years or whatever, that, that'd be great. You know, and it's okay to like, Hey, I want, I want to, I want to, I feel like I'm good in this role. I want to do this role. It's okay to move on, to move somewhere else. You know, it's okay. And, and I know that the family situations for people are different, you know, and you're thinking about other factors, but as far as, you know, in this profession, I mean, it's okay to move, move to, and try risk again while you're comfortable. You know, I think, I don't know, you know, like that, if I were to do it again, yeah, there'd be situations. I'm like, okay, I, I could have taken another risk there you know, and then got some more energy out of this thing, you know, so just from my own personal thing. Um, yeah, but I know there's so many other factors that play into decisions, but, but you know, and, and that's another thing, like, don't be too desperate in terms of job. Like, I know this, there's this, there's a lot of jobs in this, in this industry, you know, people say they're not like, stay in, stay involved, you have to stay in, you know, but at the end of the day, I think happiness comes from doing, if you really, if you're, if you're in this profession to do the job and, and because it fuels you and you, you're good at, you can help people with it, then, then that's what you're looking out for. You know what I'm saying? You're not necessarily doing it for your own, uh, you know, success or comfort. You're really doing it to help people, you know? So if that's the reason that, that fuels you, you know, so keep putting yourself positions to help people. And if you feel like you can help people in other ways and do a little bit more, then it's okay to take risks to make that happen. You know, so well, we're going to move on in some footwork and some scouting and stuff. But uh, let's just make sure coaches heard that one part, which is this develop this mission statement, which is essentially why should you pay me? And I, and I love that. I mean, it's so simple. And I think that every coach could benefit from constantly thinking about that, because in that sense, really what what you've gone through is job preservation for 18 years, which is incredible in the NBA. Right. That's yeah. I mean, it's. It's unique, and and maybe maybe that's organization. Maybe the organizational uh, organization that I worked for valued, you know, that continuity, um, that loyalty. Maybe maybe that was a big part of it. Uh, and you know, I'd be a fool not to say that is because the 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 percentages are the percent. There's a reason why it's a two year profession for that team, you know. So, uh, you know, so that environment, that that culture that I was part of, that that's a that's a big thing that they value, you know. So. Uh, but yeah, preservation is huge because when the contract runs up, you're, they're looking at you and they're, they're trying to figure out reasons not to keep you. You know, that's, that's the thing with the contract, you know, and if it's like, oh, okay, he does that service that can't be replaced, you know, that's, that serves me. And I can't, I don't know how I have to train that position. And I think that's where old school ways, that's, that's what old school ways got it wrong. Old school ways was about keeping your job like and not letting people in you know new school is about how do you make everything better and the culture better but you're keeping your job because that value is just like it's not too many people that's mastered how to serve me in that area you know so uh whether it's coach or gm or both you know or if you are the head coach the owner or, you know that deal that's why they're keeping you around you know because you're serving their need like and they can't, they know that you fit with them, you know? So, but you got to do a, go about it. I think in, a, in a new school way, which is inclusion and it's, it's energy towards everybody and it's, it's, it's empowerment and getting people better. But back in the days, it was the same, philo same philosophy, but in a different way, it was protection, you know, it was guarded. It was that, you know, it was cutthroat, you know? And I think those sort of things, I think now will get you labeled that you can't come back in, <laughs> you know, because everybody talks now. It's all it's more open. Back then, it was strictly relationship and protection, you know. So I think it's it's a different from what I've been in the league when I first started. That's what I experienced, and then I've seen the tr uh, the change. So, hey, coach, a quick interruption from this episode for a mention from our supporters, who without them, this podcast would not be possible. By using the links I mentioned in these advertisements, it enables me to continue providing this podcast for free for you. The wait is finally over. Football is in full effect, with many teams strutting their stuff. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. 
from game spreads and totals to team, player, and coaching props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code ARMCHAIR. That's ARMCHAIR in all capitals to take advantage of all the great sign up bonuses. Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. So fascinating. And uh, again, I thank you for sharing this. And uh, I, I really enjoyed your Pro Coach Summit presentation on offensive footwork and skill development. And I encourage everyone to check it out on coachtube.com. But you discussed footwork at length. Can you outline why footwork, even at the professional level, is still so important? I think it's so new, to be honest with you, Chris. So it's a it's a it's a new kind of creative idea that like players are doing in the off season. Here, here's my two cents on that: it, skill development is like creating problems for the players to kind of figure out and then and acquire new skills. That's developing skills to me, which can kind of get in the way of player development, right? So I remember when you came over to the Thunder, and you did a great, great presentation that got us all thinking. Uh, uh, but it, it, it's, 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 it's randomized drilling and so important. And it's putting the game situation or potential because anything can happen in a game, but the skill of making a layup through contact, right. Is that's always going to happen in the game. And these players have found that throughout the years, like they know how to do that. So you're basically making them, you know, aware of their skill that they already have. And if they if you encounter problems, then you can address those problems to, you know, get them better. Like the inner game of tennis. If you guys haven't read that book, amazing book, right? So it's, it's like, all right, here's tennis, hit a bunch of forehands, hit a bunch of backhands, hit a bunch of serves, right? And then, and, and then eventually you're teaching by like the, the actual result, you know, all right, we got a couple backhands that were that, what we're actually looking for in my mind. Now you're asking questions to the player. Like, what did you figure out? how did you get to that point? And they're basically giving you the feedback that they fit, how they figured it out. And then you're kind of referencing back to that whenever you need to, you know, but that's, that's important from developing. You're, you're developing the actual game skill or tennis skills that's necessary to perform in a game. Well, this skill development and footwork, it's, it's creating sort of problems for these guys. Okay. You can hit a backhand in tennis. Well, how can you hit a backhand when the ball is coming at you in, you know, different ways, it's coming back at you in a knuckleball way. Are you, do you have every kind of spin possible on the backhand? You got a one hand or two hand backhand, you know, can you close your eye or not see the ball and see it last second and still hit and perform the backhand? Like you're making these t- tasks even more impossible in the moment, but once they master, they get these little edges to their game that can adapt them for more situation. You know what I'm saying? So in a way it's kind of dangerous to creating sort of problems for them, you know, whereas you know, with player development, it's like you're basically showing them what's going to happen in the game that they already probably know how to do. And you're exposing that they already know how to do that. And if there are any problems, you're kind of creating solutions with them and they're figuring it out. You know, where a skill development, development, you're basically saying, all right, you have, I'm going to expose you to things you cannot do. And we're going to figure out how to complete these tasks and, and master these tasks. And then you will be slightly better with each new task that you get. You know what I mean? So, yeah, that that that's different. So with footwork, I mean, yeah, it's just, again, like it's sort of a new era of uh, skill development in the summertime. And a lot of these trainers that are, you know, they're Instagram sellers, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, you know, there are certain guys that really know what they're talking about that you can like learn from, you know, and, and have a different approach that I think the more these years keep adding on the more these kids are starting to go through these waves of training you know so i think teams should have these sort of processes or like an understanding maybe a coach on their staff that can that can you know adjust with these sort of times of skill development uh but again i don't think it factors in in terms of wins and losses but with continuity the players will feel like they're you know that they're getting a lot of love in these certain areas to get them better you know, so, so, so can can I try and bring this I guess, more concisely? Because uh, I love what you're saying, and I could agree more. Uh, clearly, we knew we we're simpatical in a lot of these philosophies. Uh, so, essentially, when you're saying problem solving, I'll give you a quick example. A lot of trainers, for example, would only teach a skill from directly facing the basket, 
as right. opposed to having starts for, and this is a really simple version of what you're saying, having starts from different foot positions, from different angles, from different facing positions. And now simply by moving the player in a different direction before they start, that does what we call creates contextual interference. It interferes with them remembering what they right. did before, which is what you're talking about, which is your loading challenge and problem solving. That's right. That's right. That's right. And, and you're right. You're, they're, they're used to create it, you know, figuring out a task from one certain point, change it slightly. And they they would have to figure it out again, you know, in a different way. And yeah, that's, that's, that's absolutely just create a little more problems each time for whatever skill, you know, and, through the course of them mastering that they'll slightly get a little bit more, maybe confidence, not the word, but you know, they'll have more to their bag in a way. Well, they'll have more solutions, right? Also, like ultimately, even right. though in the moment they won't necessarily feel as comfortable if you did 10 reps that's of the right. exact same thing. Right? That's right. And that's the challenge. And I think that's still, as we've talked about, and I think I've talked about with many people, that's still a reach because we're so focused, especially on the NBA level on the comfort and confidence of the player that if we, right. if we jolt them, then suddenly they look at us like we're doing something wrong to them. How do you get past that at that level? Yeah. I mean, it, again, I, it's a, we're, there's a part of our job as teachers, but we're also sellers a little bit, you know, do you, do you get do the players understand why, you know, what big picture is, but there's, you know, like we said, a mission statement is basically yourself and you're selling. You're doing the same thing with the player. Like you're selling something that they feel or that they will get better on. And then you're going to eventually get some feedback when you have some traction. But you have to hold on to that. You know what I mean? And and if they can feel that and feel that they're going to get better long term and understand that from a sales pitch point of view, you know, then then you got it. You know what I'm saying? Like that's same thing with shooting. I've done a lot of shooting development. Right. So. You know, if you go real technical, it's going to be hard to get the sell in. But if you can get it in, then you kind of have them and you can really coach them the way you want to coach them if they understand why, you know. So, again, I, I hate to use the word sell because you're, you're teachers, but there's selling involved, you know, where they actually really believe and they, they bought it, you know. Um, and true salesman, that comes from relationships and trust. Uh, but same thing, you know, like you're selling a product that you think can help them. Here you're selling, you know, a skill or a task that it's creating a problem right now for them, but they know and they have they have a feel and they have a belief that by the end of this thing it's gonna get better, they're gonna get better. And then you gotta make sure that they get better by it. You know, if they don't get better by it, then you're then there's no more sell. You're not gonna keep selling anymore, <laughs> you know. So right. You have to show that it's working for them in the game. Because ultimately that's the only test of retention. You know, we can talk about anything we want about someone dribbling through cones or whatever you want to talk about. The only test is it helping them in the game. Is it helping them in performance? That's right. It, yeah. I mean, especially with player with player development. Yeah, absolutely. That That's the most important thing for player. I, I, that's why I differentiate that in skill stuff. The mm -hmm. skill, it will eventually, you know, give, but you don't know if they're used or not used. But they're like, you know, a tennis player that can turn and spin a couple of times. And next thing you know, hit a backhand like, great, they can do that. But can, like, how does that help them in the game? Well, it, do they, it does, though, because their skill set is a little bit higher. You know what I'm saying? But it's you're not going to see examples of that, especially right away. That's why there's like a fine line and there's really not a, um, you know, a implementation of true skill development, you know, in professional like team play yet. A lot of this stuff is happening during the off season, you know, because again, you know, we're working on a slide step deal that maybe a coach doesn't want, but just the ability to do that increases you as a player in terms of the number of tasks you can do. You know what I'm saying? But it, this, the, it's going to be a hard sell because if you do that in the game, you have, maybe you haven't mastered it yet. You can get in trouble for it. You know what I'm saying? So to me, the player development is, a, it's a different deal. It's strictly about the game you know what i'm saying and and that's not what I'm, I'm not saying here like we should go all in on skill development but i do think there's a little a level of that especially in off seasons or strategic ways that you know i haven't seen yet that i would love i'm very curious about 
in terms of putting in. And then, you know, and, and, and that's the thing about the league. In the league, you got so many people on staff that help make decisions. You can have, yeah, sports science is such a big thing right now. Let's say you do skill, skill development tasks. It's going to take up some of the player's energy in terms of their change of directions and stuff medically that other people are looking at. That's important. You know, let's say you do 30 minutes of skill development, then they have practice, you know, and, and they look a little tired in practice. Well, you're in trouble now because somebody is aware of the work you've done. You know what I mean? With cutting and moving, you know, it towards maybe certain things that don't directly apply to that practice. You know what I mean? So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of things with, with, with decision-making in terms of at the N- NBA level, I think depending on like how the teams are structured, you know, um, that, that are big, big, like who are the actual you know, people that make decisions or that, you know, that can help you, you know, but sports science now is another area that, that you have to like lean to, you know, are we doing too much? Are we, because at the end of the day with, I think head coaching is, can you get the best out of the players during the game? And now with that approach, people are not taking, you know, they're not practicing as much and they're getting the input from, you know, professional scientists uh, on, on load management as we've all heard and stuff like that. But you've got to really study that stuff now, especially in pro sports. Well, the integration of everything together. I mean, the best organizations are doing that. Um, I saw that at OKC. I mean, you're just, you have integration of everything involved in the decision of what to do with the player and what to do with the team. And it's tremendous. Before we move on, can you just, it may be in one sentence for each or one or two sentences for each, just re- let's refresh what you mean by skill development versus player development. Yeah, I think, I think skill development, player development, easy one. It's, it's, it's being performing on the court, performing in a game. I think what you, what you mentioned, Chris, it's all about, are you implementing it in the game? That's strictly it, right? That's, that's big picture. Skill development to me is acquiring and mastering new skills. It's creating, can you create more problems and find solutions to those problems? Can I, add, can I add one thing? Because I love this. When you said these before, these are tremendous definitions. The one thing I add to skill development sometimes is we don't think about skill development. Well, we only think about it as the addition of something, but sometimes it's the removal of something as well, right? Yeah, because you're creating right. more of an efficiency in something. So I love both aspects of that. And uh, I think it gives an easy way to be able to think about it. That's right. That's absolutely right. Absolutely. So take us through, I mean, by the time the podcast release will be beyond the NBA draft, but maybe let's start from a point of this, because this curiosity has always been there for me. You draft a player as an organization. What is the process from drafting a player to now prioritizing the development, whether it's skill or player development, to help that player succeed in your organization. What are some of the things that happen after they're drafted? They come to you and now you prioritize certain things. I think professional habits are the first is the first year. You get that done right away. You know, so summer league usually happens every year and you, you can kind of like sit back, let them be them. But at the same time, you know, they should get an understanding of what uh, the main figures that touch them you know, like the equipment or, you know, just the people that they are in contact, the media, kind of what the image of the team is, um, how the certain main processes work, you know, what their, their equipment, their loop, you know, uh, that sort of stuff. It happens in, in summer league. And then you're actually as a coach, you're watching them sort of perform and what, and just kind of sitting back and seeing what they do well. Right. So the first year is just, it's professionalism. It's what does that mean? What does that look like? You know, um, are they listening to the vets on the team? You know, um, hopefully they have a relationship with the vets on the team. Uh, but yeah, that's, you know, practice. Are you showing up on time? You know, those sort of things are, you know, uh, getting used to the travel. This is what the, the, the walkthroughs are looking like, you know, uh, whatever your cultural values are, you know, you're kind of getting all that in and you're teaching them how to be a professional that first year. You know, and then and then from that, then the summer times is where where you really really start with, and maybe even the first year, like it's gonna be on your system stuff. You know, like are they depending on the your, you know, I've I've heard on some of your uh, clinics, you know, like the teams running habits, you know, like just big picture systematic stuff. Like that's what they're getting in for shell. Are they in the right spots? You know, are they doing the right rotations? 
You know, those are sort of things you're putting goals on, you know, do they know how professional, do they know how to watch film? Are they watching personnel, you know, before um, the day before, are you asking them questions on that? Are you holding them accountable to that? Or are you, you know, are there the nutrition, is it up to your team standard? Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of things to, to do in the first year, you know, and, 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 and that's, that's, that's the most important. And then I think going into the next year, that's really where their game, like, how can we grow it a little bit more, you know, like, so and then that, that's kind of a real analyzation, you know, in terms of what their game is and how to like kind of pivot it or, you know, that kind of stuff. But the first year is strictly professionalism, I believe, you know, uh, summer league is where you we really first start and you got to sit back and I think watch them summer league. And then the training camp, you just, yeah, can they master your team stuff? And that's that's really the first year. It's it's great perspective to understand and uh, to get into some of these other topics we're, which we're going to talk about. And, uh, you know, I, I want you to get into this. Can you talk about the drop position and the yeah. open drop position? So let's start with the drop position. Yeah, the drop position is basically, it's, it's you know, it. Uh, I think, so Michael Lancaster studied players for like 20 years right and and he he puts spots on the floor that most players attack from so they attack from this position of a staggered stance back foot is really pushing off in a certain way that's giving it's giving the player a, a burst you know and it's not something that was taught to a lot of the me it, it was just something that was acquired you know and and it's it's funny hearing good players talk about this sort of position they have different you know, phrases. I think Kobe Bryant, when I was watched detail, had a had a different phrase for it. Uh, but that's the drop is like the most commonly used, you know, based from the trainers. Uh, so yeah, it's that position of attack that usually and most that most of the time happens. There's different ways to kind of get into that position. When you freeze frame, you have to, you know, there's a moment of reading the game, pocketing the ball, uh, that you know, the 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 argument is like, oh, that's going to be a carry. And, you know, that's usually the counter. But if you have your hand to the side, it again, it's a skill that's acquired. It takes a little while uh, to, to get. Uh, but yeah, and then and you push it off, right? You know, there's a there's a level of lotus to learn. Uh, the open drop is is really, you get to that position a lot of times in um, on post-ups. When you, when you side jab, you know, you, you, your feet are wide. You know, and they're they're more in a in a in that sort of position. It's not staggered. It's another just another position to attack from. Uh, and usually happens in in post situations. You can happen. You know, if you, if you come down the court and you just you know get into that wide stance, and the wide stance is huge because yeah, it it gives you angles to attack that you know either the top foot or you know the bottom foot. But it basically the defender. You know, if they're the same level as you with their feet, then you're going to you it's going to be hard to get to get through and find an angle to go through the guy. You know, so that's why usually coaches, especially ball handling coaches, believe in a wide, wide stance. Uh, but, yeah, it's the open the open drop. Again, it's not staggered. It's wide drop is, is a staggered stance. Uh, then the inverted drop is a staggered stance. Just your the ball, the, the ball side foot is back with the ball. Uh, and it's usually a stance that, that leads to a push cross um, crossover or in and out, uh, which trainers say is inverted drop to a basically turn dribble. And you, you're, it's basically an in and out move uh, where you sell, you're selling the, the, the push cross. And, and the, the good thing about the drop position, it's a position to attack. The defense is going to react when you get to that spot. Now, do you have the ability to read the game, you know, encounter or shoot out of that spot? Uh, it, it, is, it takes a lot of work. So, you know, if you just say get into a drop, I mean, that the drop, you know, get into that position various ways takes a lot of work. And then and then actually, you know, um, having the same sort of position every time, I think, can only help you out as a player just to feel that. That's why I think the mats are so huge because of accountability. You know, there's some things I think the block training is helpful. I do think on some of these aspects that block training is really, really helpful because you can, the, the skill is to feel that position, same position every time, you know, so. Well, it, uh, so I love this. And, uh, you know, it, it, planes of movement is really the description that we're talking about, that the body can move in these different planes of movement. And, and the other part that I like is, I mean, and maybe I'm wrong with this, but what I interpret is 
I've always called one wide is basically shooting position. And then two wide is essentially dribbling position. So your feet, one wide, your feet are within your body shoulder width. And then dribbling position is essentially both feet outside of shoulder width apart. And then sometimes you go to three wide, which would be a little bit wider, certainly when you're dribbling, but also when you're pivoting in different situations like that. So it's really teaching players these different movement planes, which comes back to that full circle conversation where we've said that too often we only load it in one, in one movement plane, right? Straight That's line right. facing the basket. And you've got to learn yeah. how to stagger and have your feet in different positions. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tremendous right. stuff and I love how you phrase it. No, I think that's good. So the two wide would be the drop uh, staggered, where you're staggered and you're too wide. And then it's interesting you to get to that position to a shooting position, you know, whether you bring your, your top foot back into a one wide or you bring your back foot forward into a one wide position, or do you just pop your feet into a one wide position? Three different ways to shoot off of the drop position. But, you know, th- 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 that that's and just talking you, about that, that, is that the player's choice ultimately, or is that something you would dictate to them if they're struggling possibly, but if they're okay with it, it's the player's choice of which way they would do I th- it? I think it's the players. Cause again, I, I, I separate the two, the two categories, right? So right. player development, you're not looking at that sort of thing, skill development. You're just acquiring these different skills and whatever they are comfortable doing in their own, you know, reacting to in their own body. That's the most important thing. I don't think for them to think about these skills in live action can do them any good. Unless you're working on a, like Kobe Bryant used to do that. Okay, I want to, I'm only going to do left-hand layups with my underhand. And he would do that while he plays. And next thing you know, he would start to figure out his body would start to figure out how to do that in game. Like if that's the purpose, but the purpose of this is just to, again, add flexibility, variety, and whatever you naturally will go to is what you naturally go to. Some guys and trainers actually, um, they they chart right their player and they have all the different ways you can shoot and they'll chart what they actually do in games you know what i'm saying and then then they might get with the player in an off season say do we want to add these sort of things to it right and maybe they work on it during pickup ball and then next year that 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 chart will change a little bit you know what i'm saying but i do think it's all about players reaction that's the most important thing i think um that again, the skill development is just them having the ability to feel their body shoot in, in different ways or get into those different wide positions that you're talking about. And then learning how to like attack out of that, you know, and completing different tasks. And you're, they're adding and they're going to end up fumbling around because these are different things that their body is not used to doing, especially when they're focused on just doing that. They might naturally do it at times during games, but to actually force their body into doing these movements will be new to them. You know, but I think them completing those tasks in the long run, they'll have just more more things they can actually feel and go to um, as as the years you know go along. But uh, lastly, again, to simplify to answer your question, though, nothing dictated. Like, no, in that situation, go to you know uh, from a drop and then bring your foot back for a shot in this situation. I, I don't think that does anything better for the player. A lot of places I want to go, and, and maybe let's finish with go with that one first. And, and really in this process, what you're doing is you're exposing a player to something and then you're right. asking them how it feels rather That's than right. telling them they have to do it this way. Okay. So you show them three possible solutions and they say, Hey, this is the one that feels the most comfortable. That's what you're saying. That's right. That's, That's right. true. That's teaching. To me, that's teaching. And I think too often we think teaching is telling them exactly what to do. And then when they do it exactly the way I tell them to do it, I feel good that I've taught something. But teaching is giving them possibilities and them choosing the best solution for themselves. I really think ego is a big part of that, Chris. I think think it's, again, who are you serving? You're serving that player. You're serving their needs to get better, you know? So by asking questions, and, and, and them coming up with solutions and like them feed the feedback of, I feel comfortable with this one. That's great. We figure, you know, we found something that they're comfortable with. They can get to that in games. You know, it's easy to get to that in games. So then, you know, raising that confidence uh, to do those things in games, that's huge, you know? So, but that's what it's about. I think a lot of that stuff that you're, you're talking about, like we got them to do that because I wanted them to do that. That's an, to me, that's an ego thing. That's an ego thing. So the other thing that 
a noise is the wrong word, but these conversations about, oh, you know, fundamentals and footwork, fundamentals and footwork, absolutely fundamentals and footwork, because it all starts from the feet. Everything in basketball starts from the feet. But I think too often we, we don't understand that ball handling is a footwork drill above all else, isn't it? Above all else, it's a footwork drill. It's not a dribbling situation, ball hand, ball right. to ground. It's footwork. I think, uh, Chris, if, if you can have that ability to pocket the ball, then your feet are going to come along with the, then it's all foot. It is like, you know, you, it's going to unlock so many things that all you're thinking about is getting to certain footwork and the ball is just coming with you. You know what I mean? Instead of, but if you, you don't pocket the ball, you're coming along with the ball. Like that ball is only like a, it's only a split second where that ball has to be dribbled if your hands on top of it. You know, just by putting the hand on the side, it's going to expose you to a lot more footwork that you're able to do. It's going to unlock actually a lot more footwork than that you can be able to do than if the hand was on, on top of the ball all the time. Well, and that's where this block dribbling stuff where a person's stationary dribbling is a limitation because essentially the feet don't move. The feet stay in one place and all good handlers, their feet are so involved in any type of dribble. That's right. That's right. It's feet, feet and eyes, feet and eyes. You know, I, you know, the, the skill, the footwork will get you. It, it's funny. You just think about the footwork and, you, and then you watch yourself on film. It's like, whoa, I did all that. And all I was thinking about was my feet, you know, and I just actually I had a kid today that I was working with, um, you know, and it's like, oh, okay, well, instead of saying do this and do this and do this and do that, it was like, okay, feel that footwork, feel this footwork, feel that. And next thing you know, he did like three or four things just by his feet. And the ball just kind of came with him, which was, which was amazing, you know, but then part of the game is also your eyes. You know, are you, are you working on shots game? Like, because you, know, you do stuff with the feet, but then where are your eyes going? You know, what are you seeing? You know, are there, there are moments where you're pausing that you can make this a decision you know what I mean? And, and I think the more you pocket the ball, the more you use footwork, the more situations you can be to read the game. But then you got to train yourself to actually read those game, read the game in those moments, if, if that makes any sense. You know, but I think a lot of a lot of guys, they, they do they do work and they'll know the end result, you know, or they'll look at the rim way too early. That's unrealistic in games, you know, um, that makes it a lot easier. But it's like, can you distract their eyes? So then their eyes get back onto the rim when it, when they will get on the rim at the rim uh, during the game. You know, I think there's, there's some tricks to that, you know? So well, I love it. Cause it just drives home the point again, like you can get comfortable with the ball and you can get comfortable dribbling the ball, but can you apply it right that's in right. the way that it needs to be applied? And that's really what you're talking about with player development that's and right. skill development in these two areas. Right. Right. Just, just to be clear too, you also talk about this relative to shooting which is that we don't want to practice shooting from just one set of footwork and from one position relative to the basket. We want to have different foot positions versus square all the time. Can you explain that philosophy? Yeah, I, I think because it, it'll get you more situated for games, especially versus taller, you know, more athletic guys. The, re, the reason why defensively, those the, the physical trait of a defender can really affect um, the game so much is because yeah, you feel rushed as an offensive player. You're not used to shooting that certain way it, because, you know, it, now in games you are, let's say you play against uh, less competition. Well, basically you're shooting practice shots against less competition. Competition in the, the physical level and the um, the height and all that athleticism goes up. You're, you're not looking at the rim the same. You know what I'm saying? So are you practicing what you're going to experience against the gray competition? where you only see the rim for like a second, or this is when you see the rim, how are you training your body to shoot that way? You know, and it might be in different ways than you, than you ever done. You know what I mean? But if you've practiced them, then you can actually do those things in those, in those situations. And I think that's what you should be training for though. You know, um, it's funny you get an NBA guy and he plays against lower level competition in the summertime. He's, the game it's he's just doing stuff he practices that in like normally you know what i mean and then he plays against his level of competition better guys and he, he just can't do that because he hasn't exposed himself to do that against better competition you know and i think you could take that and run with it uh but yeah i mean that's right that's why i think all the different sort of footwork uh to shoot out of 
because you never know when you're going to get to them. And it, it shouldn't be the first time you're doing a certain footwork in a game and you're only doing it because the guy's, you know, taller than you. You know, you got to adjust for that, you know, on the front end. You got to know when you're going to probably see the rim against much better competition and then actually try to do that task in, in shooting drills. You know what I mean? And I think well, that's why, I, guys, yeah. I'm just going to say so much of this is that you're practicing imperfect, right? You're not practicing perfect. You're practicing that's imperfect. That's right. That's right. I, I think you have to because, yeah, it, again, you're going to eventually encounter better players. Absolutely. You know? it, it, it's such an easy – like, that's the NBA. It's like you want a good defense. You have to – if you have certain players with certain length and athleticism that's more so than you're, uh, than the team you're playing against, you're probably going to have a really good defense, you know, if, they, if you can get them play hard. So let's let's bring home a different point with this. Say we're talking about shooting and you're watching a player shoot block reps on air – over and over again. Here's why that has limitations based on what you're saying. Number one, you will rarely have a perfect catch and perfect footwork prior to shooting at a high level against, let's say against good competition. And then the second part is before you even shoot, you have all these other perceptions, right? Where's the defender? Where are my teammates? Am I in space? Am I open? All these different perceptions happen before you shoot. So if we only practice in this perfect bubble, then the player is less likely to transfer that to the game when, as you're saying, they're put in these imperfect situations. Absolutely. And I would say more so with off the dribble shooting. Hmm. Talk, now, if you talk if to me about the, that, because it's the rise, the off the dribble shot, right? <laughs> that's right. It's the rise. It's, it's, it's again, when you see the rim, you're seeing the rim with a lot of movement with the ball, you know? So that's when you're seeing, and I, I noticed a lot of, a lot of guys do practice reps where they, it's, you know, they're looking at the rim way in advance, you know, and they're, they're pulling up for the shot way in advance, but in the game that might be more rushed than that. It might happen quicker than that, you know? So like, I, I think that's where uh, that can change the outcome of a lot of players when they go against heightened competition. Hey coach, a quick interruption from this episode for a mention from our supporters who, without them, this podcast would not be possible. By using the links I mentioned in these advertisements, it enables me to continue providing this podcast for free for you. The wait is finally over. Football is in full effect, with many teams strutting their stuff. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals, team, player, and coaching props, BetOnline gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to BetOnline today and use promo code ARMCHAIR, that's ARMCHAIR in all capitals, to take advantage of all the great sign-up bonuses. BetOnline, your online sportsbook experts. Listen up, fellows, because today we have a new Manscaped product alert. Manscaped just released the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. Take a look in the mirror and I guarantee you'll see hair sticking out of those holes. It's time to keep your ear and nose hair looking as nice as your clean-shaven pubes. Manscaped is forever changing the grooming game with their Weed Whacker. The nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes. The premium Manscaped Weed Whacker uses a 9,000 RPM motor-powered, 360 degree rotary dual blade stem. Its intelligently contoured design enhances the trimming experience and it is waterproof, which makes for easy operation and cleaning. Look, fellas, 79% of partners polled admitted that long nose hair is a major turnoff. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code armchair at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code armchair. What are you waiting for? Go whack your weed. Thank you, Manscaped, for keeping our pubes trimmed and hairs in our holes looking nice. Now back to the podcast. You know, that is uh, such a great point. I just want to drive that home because what you're saying, again, is essentially the rim is your last perception. That's and right. before you even look at the rim, you have all these other perceptions and decisions yeah. that are happening. And when you just do these, say you go three times between your legs, pick up the ball and shoot – and you're looking at the rim the whole time you go three times between your legs, that essentially never happens in a game. So if you're working on that, it's not going to transfer. That's right. That's right. 
that's why I think I think you're 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 definitely right on the fo- footwork is key. It drives everything, but then the eyes are huge. Mm-hmm. Eyes are a big. Eyes are a big part of of, and that's another layer, um, another, another complexity to uh, development, for sure. Well, I love that. I love that you bring that up, uh, the, the, the eyes. And do you have any keywords or stuff like that for the eyes? I've always used peak, that you've got to be constantly peeking to see things around you or scanning people have used. What are some of the keywords do you use for eyes? I just, honestly, it's as simple as eyes on the rim, you know, uh, but with, with, with certain tasks to get their eyes off the rim, I'll use like rip cones where they're like doing these certain tasks, or I'll just have them use their imagination. The old coach K deal, like, Imagine the defender right here. Then imagine when you do this footwork, the guys right here, you know, that kind of, or the NBA, we're fortunate to have a lot of bodies. So you can almost like, you know, through random training, get them to look at the rim at the rock, you know, whenever you want them to look at the rim, but just by the uh, creativity of your drills, you know, uh, some people use tennis balls where they distract them with what's the color of the tennis ball. And then when, uh, when is the moment they're telling you what that color is. And then, then you can force when they're actually looking at their eye at the rim you know what i'm saying but i use i just use eyes on the rim and i think especially i apply that a lot uh when when they catch and shoot on spot ups i'm a big believer in that in that situation i think you can dictate over the defense uh at any level of when you're open and, and what you can shoot over and i think the first thing that you should do on catches this is probably the only thing i really dictate to players are on spot ups is is eyes on the rim first like be that for instead of what I think guys, it's hard for guys. They predetermine what they're going to do on a spot up before the ball even gets to them. But if they, I think they're at an advantageous position. If they look, if no matter what they catch the ball, they go into the footwork they're used to doing on a spot up. Uh, because I think that will lead to efficiency on spot ups and they look at the rim and then they go from there. Now, a lot of players have a tough time looking at the rim first they, they can do it for a rep or two, but in their mind, they're making these decisions on the front of the ball to them, you know, and I, I'm a big believer it's only on spot of situations. That's, you should be looking at the rim pretty much every time first, you know, because if you do that, sorry, yeah. eyes on the rim, because that means you can essentially see everything in front of you that, that you need to see. Right. That's right. That's right. And I don't think uh, players naturally, they're basically making judgments not from the rim level first making judgments while the ball's in the air to them. You know what I mean? Where I think the important thing there is to get themselves shot ready, right? To catch the ball, look at the rim, and then you go from there in terms of making the decisions. You basically have them figure out depending on the talent level or whatever it may be, or the angles that you're talking about before, uh, they're going to figure out solutions of when to drive, when to shoot. And then you know what's going to happen, Chris, is, then the shot fake is not going to be like a d- predetermined move. They're, sh- they're shot faking because they actually wanted to shoot, you know, and it's actually a better shot fake, you know, and, and that's when, you know, you got them with the spot up stuff when they starting the shot fake unnaturally or unpredictable, you know, and it's, and they're going to actually feed back that to you. Like, Oh, Vinny, man, I, I didn't even mean to shot fake. I was thinking shot and I felt him. That's the great feedback right there. Once you, once you have that feedback, then you got them as far as just with this philosophy, you know, but it takes a lot of sell in there uh, because the players are going to fight. They're going to, their instincts are going to tell them to like just catch and go or, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Uh, but I, I like the philosophy of looking at the rim first, pretty much every time on spot of situations. Oh, I love it. And uh, just connecting that for the people that, uh, and I know, you know, this, the basketball decision training stuff that I share the BDT shooting, where there's a cue from the passer, hands up, hands down, step towards different things like that. That's, that's exactly the goal of what you're trying to explain here is yeah. that's the goal is to be able to stimulate them to see things other than the rim to start with, but their visual cue is the rim, right? Yeah, because yeah. They have to, so I shouldn't say to see other things, they have to be aware of everything prior to shooting the beautiful thing is that with all those things you're talking about is you can guarantee it on every spot up situation you can guarantee that happening Mm -hmm. right you don't have and when you catch and go and you do stuff that's predetermined you're you're reacting you haven't done any of the shot prep stuff that you can guarantee and you're pulling the plug you know what i'm saying and then the defender what they're reading is they're reading you like when they're closing out to you they're reading that you're basically going and if they catch you 
see, NBA is big on narratives, right? These sort of things on spot ups. And if a guy basically catch and goes or like is predetermined, it feedbacks to the players to not rush feedbacks to the coaches that you're basically not playing on your terms. You're not playing on your pace. You don't have control of the game and it can only take one play and you can be labeled that way. Oh, he's inexperienced. He's rushed to combat that. If you're playing on your own terms, especially in spot up situations, which when you're going to be a rookie in the league, that's what you're going to be in first. Uh, you know, well, anyways, that to me, playing on your own terms is so huge. And I use that a lot. Play, you know, don't be predict, play on your, it's your terms. And that's basically everything you said. Get aligned the way you can guarantee to get aligned. Look at the rim and go from there. And if, you know what, they stay with you. All you do is pass the ball, but you're playing on your terms. You know what I mean? And next thing you know, you're starting to get labels as being smart, you know, under control. Those sort of things can only do you well. Because this whole game is about trust. You're paying these guys tons of money. You want to be able to trust them every single time. And it only takes one or two where they're just like fast, rushed, predetermined. And that could that could kill the trust, you know? So that's why I think that, that spot-up situation is big, especially on the NBA level. Well, it's big, becoming big at all levels, obviously, that that the one skill that can separate you. And it struck me as you're saying this this – and this, that on-air repetitions, it doesn't necessarily mean they're doing lazy skill repetitions, but it inherently is lazy perceptually because there's no perceptual, right? And that's where you're talking about the eyes is that you can get really lazy in those situations and not having your eyes in the right spot and learning how to apply what you're doing in the game. That's right. It's a, it's a one area, area of real, real big discipline that I, that I believe in is that, that yeah, on-air, you know, uh, this spot up situation. Yeah. And it takes a lot of work. Honestly, I, I t- it's a big battle, you know, and I'm, I think I'm willing to keep fighting that battle with a lot of the other stuff, especially off the dribble. I'm so big on flexibility and creativity and, and, and huge on footwork and uh, you know, kind of like putting him in tough, tough situations, but the spot up situation, I think that's something that you have an advantage. You just like, why not take advantage of the advantage that you, you have in terms of it's your, you have control, you know, when that ball is coming to you, you can prepare a certain way every single time, you know, and when you look at the rim, that defense has a tough, tough time because they have no clue what you're doing. You know what I mean? And now if you have the ability to shoot, and make that shot, then it's over. Like, it's really, really good. Then, you know, but then it takes a lot of different work, a lot of skills to feel that defender and, and feel a, a better defender increased at you know an athlete like in terms of the distance you need and the, that's all feel you know and you might get your shot blocked a couple times uh you you know you might make a wrong decision here and there but you're gonna you're gonna start to adapt and figure out like that feel in terms of that close out of the defender and a lot of times if the defender closes to you and their hand is down you can make that shot that is very 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 intimidating to the other team and that's something to train like you should still shoot the ball if you can see the rim, no matter what, if the defender is there or not, you know, that's a huge advantage. That guy has to have his hand up and, and really take away that rim for you to, to drive. Now think about that. Your driving angle now is really easy to see, you know? So, yeah. I've heard you use the word or sorry, the phrase dominating spot. So essentially what you're saying is a spot up position now is a dominating spot, much like we would think about like Kobe in a kill spot. I think he used that term, right? Like a player who can dominate a spot in a spot up is so valuable nowadays. So valuable. So, so valuable. And then, and, and everybody has the ability to do that, you know, and, and the off the dribble stuff, I think dominating spots on the floor that you're comfortable with is, is big, you know, get to spots that you feel very, very comfortable with. And I'm a big believer in the pull-up shot. I think it's an easy shot. And I think a lot of your good players, those are the spots on the floor that they like to get to. And I think, I think the game, you know, took that away from a lot of players, you know, and it made, it made the drop defenses, et cetera, so killer because players are not allowed to shoot that shot, you know, and I think that's starting to change back. How hard is it for a player to, to not shoot a shot that they would normally shoot. And then how are we convincing players to not do that? Cause that's gotta be really tough. Organizationally. Yeah. You want to, you want, you want to get paid. Do not shoot the shot. 
you know, and, and that's how much conviction level that teams have on this. Uh, and I, I just really feel like that's changing a little bit back because what, what's happening is, is in the playoffs, if you really, really pay, pay attention, I, I think, is that that shot is coming back, you know, and, and that's why I think a lot of the, the points and, you know, uh, percentages and, and all that kind of changes in the playoff situations. You have you almost win by that shot in the in, in maybe later on down the, the road in the playoffs. You know, so uh, I think all of that is important. The history of the game is so huge. There's a reason why players mastered those areas, you know. Um, but, yeah, when you when you dictate and you take that away from them, like Chris Paul, you know, Chris Paul in Houston, Chris Paul with the Thunder. You know, not discrediting anything Houston did. They they did a really good job and how, went really, really far. But think about Chris Paul not shooting a mid-range. You know, how much does that change who he is, you know, and how much he can help your team? So, yeah, it's going to be interesting, as you say, if it comes back or yeah. <laughs> like eventually everyone's got to adjust because obviously the defense gets good at taking away something and then the offense has to figure it out the other way or vice you, versa. You can just switch, Chris. That's the only thing. It's just like, all right, well, you know, if we just if we just, um, you know, I mean, that's what it's going to come down to. Like that that drop defense, you know, against really, really good players that have the complete freedom to shoot that shot, that should be, that should eliminate that defense just in terms of what, if the series or whatever may be, you know, then it's going to come down to your switching and how you, how your players do against the switching, you know, and it kind of comes down to that every single year. Very cool. So where, where do you see the next level of development being the most important then based on what you're saying? Yeah, I think it's, again, it's just creating, these advantages for players to basically perform like they should be able to master spots again, you know, and, and, and get there and figure out how, how to get, you know, the looks that they're used to shooting and practicing. It should come down to that. What are they, what do they, what have they mastered? And can, can your best players get to those areas where they've mastered? And, and that's, that's when it comes down to it. Now, not discounting the team uh, that, that, you're going to need, you know, but it comes down to players at the end. Uh, so that's where the player development is going. It's going in terms of, you know, special, not special, uh, adding, adding skills and adding different ways to get to certain areas of the court that they can, that they can master, you know, and just keep adding to that. Um, and then for the coach's standpoint, their, their job to me is to get the players to perform things that or do things that they, they don't want to do to win games. You know, and that's those are the little things of because it comes down to, you know, the team stuff, running back on defense, running habits on offense. You know, are you in the right spots defensively? You know, those sort of things. And then the little edges you have is how much have your players improved? That's the development you're talking about. They should be improving every single year, you know, with their skills. And then the edges come from how well has your the coaching staff maybe adjusted when they needed to and how lucky you are with referees, et cetera, like that. And luck is a big factor of it. But like, are you making tactical decisions um, that give your team a slight edge, you know, in tough moments? You know, some do and, and actually your team can win that way. Um, and then are your players creating these little edges every single year with their with their improvements, you know, as in the skill standpoint and performing against big time, big time defensive players, you know, and, and, but then at the same time, honing in on what it took to actually win in the first place, which is making them try to get the players to play hard and play the style of play that, you you know, that you've identified in terms of how, how we win as a team, you know, so all of those things kind of form in a pot that can give you a chance to, you know, to make it through later rounds in the playoffs. You brought up shot fake and uh, I'm curious then, was this a player driven or an organization driven thing that changed a shot fake from a shot fake drive to a shot fake reset, shoot the three? Love it. I think it's player. I think a guy like JJ Redick, for example. Yep. uh, It's a copycat league, you know, and then again, it's, it's organizationally. We value the three. Because usually the shot fake pull up mid range was the yep. go to ten years ago, right? Twenty years ago, thirty years ago, totally. So now it was like, no, we don't want that shot. So just sidestep and shoot the three because we really value that. That three is the is equivalent to so and so points per possession, you know. So uh, from that, it, it, you know, guys are like, okay, we're gonna ru- we're gonna run with that, 
you know? So I, I think it's because, you know, they're so they're masters of the three point shot, especially off the dribble nowadays, more so than ever. So like that is dangerous. I, w- I wouldn't want to try to shot fake and sidestep. I'd be scared again, you know? So it's from a defensive uh, situation, but it's just where one, it's just where the organizations have gone to as far as valuing that three so much more. And then it, and basically some guys, uh, that they're better if they're especially like a Reddick or Duncan Robinson, like they still have can put more fear into the de- the defense because they're saying do not make him shoot, make him drive. Good things happen, and they've kind of know themselves that like okay, when I do drive, good things happen for the defense, and bad things happen for us. So now let me figure out a way to just keep the, get the three off, you know. So uh, it's kind of where it's evolved. You know, I think player, I think it's both. I think it's both player and organizationally. Fascinating. Uh, it's a fascinating thing to kind of see and uh, how it impacts other levels, obviously, as well. Uh, because clearly, again, what's happening in the NBA doesn't apply to all levels. Uh, so, you know, those are decisions okay. that coaches have to extrapolate from these conversations. But, uh, coach, I cannot let you leave without getting into a little bit of scouting. Um, you know, I, I, I love hearing this from people that spend their whole day thinking about basketball. So can you give us some of the, maybe some of the insights or little tricks of the trade that you found most effective to be able to make a effective scouting report for players? Yeah, I'll go down to essentialism. It's, it's a pretty good book. Uh, all, all that book is basically talking about is be, be a minimalist, be go into a priority. Like what are the most, and know your audience, your audience, I guarantee almost guarantee that they're not going to comprehend too much stuff. And for you to figure that out, ask your players questions after like maybe a couple of days after you do, did a scout, like what'd you retain or maybe after the game, what'd you actually retain, you know? Uh, but yeah, my two cents on that is be minimalistic, right? Try to, the hard thing to do. And I think with experience and good coaches, uh, they eventually have like, People that work for them, you know, they'll they'll know their sayings, their go tos, right? So same thing with that team. Like just keep watching, put together your tape that you're supposed to, and watch it over and over and over again, and it will start to simplify. And then you'll start to believe, oh, it really is just about the, that and that, the three keys, you know, the two keys. And it'll, every time you watch it, you'll you'll probably be more streamlined. Up to the point, I'd probably watch it before even doing the presentation. But I think if I were to give my, my advice, I, it would be that. It would just streamline it down from a lot of information to the most – make it the most simple deal. And eventually, if you don't really believe it, keep watching it until you believe it. See it on every clip of the game. It's about these things. And eventually, in your mind, you'll be convinced of that. But maybe it's not. Maybe you have to adjust. But once you have that plan down and you really convinced that it's about those few things and you're going to be able to present it in such a way to the players and staff that they will believe it also. And at the end of the day, Chris, with scouting to me, it really affects the first like five minutes of the game. You're going to if you do it the right way, you're going to see it in action right away. Right. And then it'll just start to disappear. Now, it's the, that's the head coaching job. Um, and I'm saying there's no wrong or right. It's like, do you choose to keep? touching that up in timeouts to bring it back or you go into your team stuff, which is equally as good. Okay. The scouting gives you edges. It's going to help you in the beginning of the game. It's going to help set a foundation. And then if you start to remind the players, they'll start to follow. Ultimately what you're looking for, if you have a really, really good one, you play the same team over and over again, people on your bench are going to like, there's a big time mistake on your game plan. They're going to like, you're going to hear some murmur from them from the, from the bench, from the, from the players, that's how, you know, you really, really driven home those points, you know? So you have a vehicle to do that with personnel. You can do it. Uh, some coaches do a morning tape and, you know, I usually like to do the keys in the morning and you have the most important one to me is the scout tape right before the game. That one should bring home all the points. You should hit the same sort of keys in all in personnel and keys. And then uh, with your scout tape before the game. That scout tape before the game, though, I've seen it where we've done no shoot around, we've done nothing, but we've showed a tape on and that tape they're actually able to do in right before games. They're able to execute, you know, especially the first five minutes of game. So what, that's what, what's on that scout tape, coach? Like what are the things that are on that that must be on that scout tape to be able to make that impact? That's it, right there. Whatever that t- that tape should make the most impact in your mind. And it's gotta be brief, simple. 
And to me, if you've done, if you've already had ad- avenues to show tape beforehand, a personnel of maybe, you know, their plays beforehand or whatever it may be, that scout tape's got to re- refocus all of that on what's important. When you say brief, do you mean two to three minutes? Do you mean five minutes? What do you yeah. mean by brief? Yeah, yeah. I, I really believe a two, two minute, um, two to three minute. I've even had somewhere as like a minute and 30 seconds of raw film does the work. It does the work. I, so, I, I used to think it, before it was like five minutes of raw film. I, I really believe in two to three minutes of raw film can, should convey from a basketball standpoint, what you need to do to beat that team. And this is you talking over it while you're showing it. Yeah. I I think that's, that's big. Some coaches don't do that. I I think that's important because you, you can set the tone. You can kind of, you can say the same. And the most effective ones I've seen is when you're saying the same thing. We played San Antonio a while ago, uh, a couple of years back. And the whole deal there is I know from my time being there and just seeing their team. And also a lot of it is on the reaction of the opposing coaches, what bothers them. But if they don't get middle, they, they, they start to feel some heat, whether, I don't know if that's true or not, but I think it is, you know, so I probably said no middle, at least a hundred times, in two minutes. You know what I'm saying? Now, when the players allowed middle, the whole bench, I could hear them. You know what I'm saying? Because it, that, that to me is a good, you're going to display what you just did because you're so you like it comes down to that you know what i'm saying so if you can get into that that's unbelievable that takes some time and maybe it's multiple times playing a team but i i think that's if for me that's like the biggest thing with with, with that and then i think uh when you do walkthroughs i i don't I, I don't look at the paper like know that know the plays where you can just not rely on a piece of paper like you you just you know you you're dictating and you're in control. You're the leader right there. So I, I would have that advice. And I, I believe in just a, whatever your plays are going to do, it should tie into what your real keys are, you know, and it's not, and th- that could be for tactical. Maybe you want to stop those plays or maybe you're further driving home the point of what, what your, your keys are. So there's a little science to that, I think, but I don't think you should have more than, more than four plays. I, even three plays is great. But uh, that's just me, you know, philosophically. Some coaches are big on a lot of plays for their because it teaches their players how to learn, you know. But I just don't, I, I don't know. I, the audience to me, I just don't think they can pick up everything. It just waters things down. I don't think the human brain, especially right now in this generation, just this generation can, can retain a lot of information. I know I can't. So, but I think an exercise, a good one is to ask questions afterwards, you know, on the people that you trust, uh, you know, staff wise or your players and, you know, and, and, and you're going to see what's stuck, you know, and that's what it's a point. That's the most important thing you're serving. You're trying to get things to stick for the game. That's the most important thing. We call pregame the, if you haven't paid attention at any point prior to this time, pay attention to these points. Right. And and that should be the point that they can get it done because of this, this and this. And now that accounts for the fact that you've already done work previously, that they know how to defend cross screen, down screen or whatever it is. But that's what you're saying, essentially. That's what I'm saying. And then I think the um, uh, coach uh, Larango uh, for the clinic, he was talking about visual um, feedback um, for, for whatever reason, guys with video. Uh, that if they see it, it, it kind of impacts them, you know? So in a way you're like a movie producer, you know, you're, you're, you're showing them the footage that is kind of like conveying that message. Like, Here are the three points. And then it's like, boom, visually, they need to see that and see it working, you know? And then it, it just drives it home. It drives it home because what you're doing is you're doing the audible or the, you know, you know, through, through verbal, you're doing the verbal feedback, but now I think the visual is so huge, so huge. And I I think, I think get the clips that show exactly what you're saying. That's a big, yeah. Yeah. And and a lot of that is like whatever defense you, you display, you're going to know the same team, you know, another conference in, in the same league or whatever that does the same thing that you do watch those games of that them versus that opponent. Well, the Spurs example is such a great example because it's like, okay, if we can do this one thing, we can disrupt them. That's right. And make them a little less comfortable. 
and a little less comfortable can lead to a win. That's right. Yeah. It's funny when I, when I scout, I watch the opposing benches a lot. When I scout, I see what makes them tick because the coaches, again, especially the experienced ones, like they have the game down to a few things. And if they, and they'll, they will hold their team accountable to those things. Like that's what they really believe in. Right. It's like, Oh, then you kind of know, you kind of know where the weakness is. It, you know, if you could just watch the bench reaction, you know, I, I don't know. It's just a little tip. I've seen that sometimes and I'll, I'll go with that, you know? Um, oh, and then uh, again, coach Mariango, when he was talking about uh Teague, right. He, he, he does a certain step back when he goes right. And then he, he was going to show Al Horford or, or him communicating that to Al Horford. It, his video cu- got cut off, but those are things you should be looking at. That's huge. And if you show your players that, oh man, like that's what they need to see. Like, oh, believe it then, you know? So. Well, it's not just believing it, but it's also this self-efficacy, right? This, this efficacy right. that comes from knowing, kn- knowing something that they feel is an edge. It, yeah. It's that's just as, right. just as it important. Worked. Yeah. That's right. That's all. That's all this is. It's all this is. If they feel that it works, they will, and they will hold each other accountable. Oh my, it's so fun to watch. You know, if they, they know that it actually works and somebody doesn't do it, all of a sudden you're going to see a team that just gets on each other for the right reason, you know, so. Well, and, and to, to that point, uh, and again, I don't know about your experiences, but there's another NBA organization that, that they said that there's like two or three things that if these things happen in practice, let's say somebody gets rejected on a ball screen. If that happens in a practice, everyone in the gym has the right to lose their mind. Right. Because there's two or three things that are so important to their success that those are the things you can't lose your mind about everything on study, but you can lose your mind about these things. And I think that's a pretty cool way of putting it. Huge. If you're a new coach and you're like, man, I want I want that to happen. That's something, though, you got to see what it is for you. You know what I mean? But have an understanding. It's going to be a lot of stuff when you first get into it and then and trying to figure out what your priorities are. And you will get to it quicker uh, through this advice. But I wouldn't go into the situation with that in mind because each team and, and yourself will believe in different things than somebody else will, you know, so. So much good stuff. And uh, you and I, as people can probably hear, we could talk forever on uh, so many of these different factors. And uh, personally, uh, I just want to review uh, essentialism, which is uh, the disciplined pursuit of less. Correct. That was the book you mentioned. Okay. And then the inner game of tennis is the most reference book on this podcast. Like literally the most reference book. I think there's no other book that's been mentioned more. So coaches, (laughs) if you haven't read it, you need to read it because it's exactly what you brought up about it. It's just, it's just so unique in terms of teaching us, you know, all these different ways of being able to teach and approach learning. Um, so I can't thank you. I got, I got one way. more, Chris, uh, if ahead. I were to like talk to myself back in the days, I'd, I'd read, um, Eco is the enemy by Ryan holiday. I would have, that would have been good for me to read when I was younger for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. No, good, good book as well. Uh, to add to the list, I know coaches love to read. Uh, so those are some great books. And, uh, also just to remind coaches, uh, pro coach summit presentation, on offensive footwork and skill development, uh, I encourage everyone to check it out because you heard it on this podcast. I mean, it is tremendous to learn from. So go to coachtube.com and check that out. And uh, coach, I can't thank you enough for sharing the game with us. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun time, Chris. Absolutely. Well, thanks. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and to give the basketball podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media to show your support for us sharing the game. And to stay up to date on all things basketball immersion, subscribe to our newsletter at basketballimmersion.com newsletter.